All right, welcome everyone. Happy summer. Hope everybody's enjoying your summer. Happy Feast of the Apostles. I know we had it this Wednesday. It's a blessed feast, and I hope that everyone was able to enjoy and benefit much from the, the, the fast of the Apostles. Today, we're going to start a series about something that might be not common this day and age among maybe our stage in life. We don't typically hear much about like saint stories. And you might remember hearing saint stories when you were a kid or in Sunday school. And it was like a, just a summary like the St. story and it was nice. But really the lives of the saints were given to us and it's part of the teaching of our church. It's called hagi, hagiographies, which is basically the, the lives of the Hagi, which is the, the, the holy, or the lives of the saints. And this is something as part of the teaching in our church. And when I went to Egypt, so anybody who goes to Egypt feels this very, 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 like, real. That when you go to Egypt, we realize we have such a disconnect with the heavenly. Everywhere you go in Egypt, in the churches, in the monasteries, there's such... A, a, like a, a feeling that you are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, which is what St. Paul talks about in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. He talks about that we are surrounded by the saints. And you might have grown up seeing your parents talking to St. Mary and talking to Pope Carolus, and it's something common maybe for um, people who lived in Egypt. But for us, you know, maybe it's a little different, or it's weird, or we come here with like a Western mind, and this whole connection with the saints thing isn't, doesn't seem very normal. Why can't I just talk to God? What I wanted to do is I wanted to share a life of a great saint. I wanted to meditate on the life because when I read it and I studied it, it really is like so moving and, and, and life-changing to see the life of a holy person before us. And when we talk about the saints, we don't talk about the saint as the hero, even though they are heroes. But we talk about them in light of the grace of the Holy Spirit working through a person. So you have a normal person like me and you, so that when you hear the stories, it might seem like you're, you're listening to like, a, like, an, like an action movie or a cartoon because of some of the things that are just unbelievable in the lives of some of these saints. And so we have to see it, that this is a normal person who had parents, who had a normal life, who had money, who had society. You say, well, that was back in the third century. Do you know what type of lifestyle was going on in the time of the pagan worship in those days? There were widespread sexual parties. And I'm not talking about just like inappropriate stuff. I'm talking about parties of sex orgies, and doing all kinds of wickedness. It was a culture that you and I could not even imagine is actually a real thing. And in that day and age, in the face of such wickedness, we see such levels of holiness that I feel like we need to be inspired by. I want to be honest with you. A lot of us, the, the standard of holiness, holiness, when you think of holiness, is that the standard in which you live by? That when I raise my children or that when I build friends or I connect with others, that the standard for my life is not like I'm a good person. A lot of people come and tell me, Abu, I'm a good person. Why isn't God or, or God should do this because I'm a good person? But this whole concept of being a good person isn't what God called us to be. But God called us to be what? Holy. I was asking some parents in a parents meeting about a week ago. I said, how many of your kids know what a life of holiness is like? And they all looked at me and I said, okay, raise your hand if you feel like your kid understands that they are called to be not good kids, but to be holy. Everybody looked at me and nobody had an answer. It's not their fault. But I think even for ourselves, the standard of holiness isn't part of the lifestyle. So I'm going to give you some background on St. Mina. I'm going to talk to you guys about St. Mina who is actually one of the greatest saints of the history of the church. And I'm going to tell you guys about what events he went through and the challenges that he had to face and what it means for you and I, because sometimes you see the movie and it seems like, I don't know if you guys see the saint movies, I love the saint movies, but they're very dramatized. But they're very real also. They're very real. So just to give you a background, Saint Mina 
His mother couldn't have a child, and she was praying to the Lord. She was praying one time the, before the icon of St. Mary and Christ, and she heard the voice of Christ promising her a child and naming the child. He said, you were going to have Mina. For he said, amen, you were going to have Mina. And Mina will be, his name will be known throughout the whole world, and he will be a great saint for me. So from, from his childhood, God had called St. Mina to live a very holy calling. Is St. Mina the only one that was called to live in that way? He was the only one maybe that was called to live, you know, called to live this way through the, the voice of an icon. Okay, that, that might be strange. But is St. Mina the only one that is called to be a holy saint for the Lord Jesus Christ? I think a lot of us think, well, well he heard it from an icon. I didn't hear it. The day you came to your baptism, and the day you were chrismated, and the day that you have started or, or began to walk that walk with Christ was the day that you honored the life of being a saint for Christ. So Saint Mina was born, his father was, a, was a, the brother of a governor. So his uncle was a governor. And I want you to understand what governor meant in the fourth century. Governor meant king. Governor meant that he had all the wealth and all the riches of that country under his control. So he lived in a very wealthy family with the highest level of honors gro growing up in a palace. Okay? A lot of people say, well, those were the saints and they lived back in those days. Anybody here growing up in a palace? I visited most of, of the homes in this church. I haven't been to a palace yet. I've been to nice houses, but I haven't been to a palace yet. And I began to think, wow. I wonder what the kids, the kids that are raised in palaces with a certain mindset, what is the, the mindset that they grow up with? You would think somebody that has everything at their disposal would love the world, would love the things of the world, would have the mind of the world, would want any pleasure of the world, would be so indulged in the world that spiritual things would be so very difficult for such a person. I want you to think about us when we get a bonus. You get a bonus at work or you get a raise. The first thing you're thinking is, oh, I'm going to upgrade my car. I'm going to get a bigger house. I'm going to go shopping. I'm going to do this. This family was a holy family. To make a long story short, St. Mina grew up and his parents had very righteous holy priests raise him and teach him the ways of God. You say, okay. Priests raised him, lucky guy. Why? Because the parents knew that the standard for their child was to live a holy life. Those of us that are parents, those of us that have the responsibility to raise children or grandchildren or whatever it is that you are a little brother or sister or to look out for your teenage brother or sister, when you think, I need my kid to drink from the fountain of the living water that flows through the church, is that the mindset that we have within the church? St. Mina, his mom died when he was 11, and his father, I'm sorry, vice versa. His dad died when he was 11, and his mom died when he was 14. So he received an inheritance. Again, what did we say? He was the son of the brother of a governor living, and his father was in charge of all the finances of this government, and then he was promoted to a governor in Egypt. I want you to imagine, this 14-year-old received an inheritance of the equivalency of, let's say, $10 million. $10 million. $10 million. You're a 14-year-old kid. You lost both of your, fam your parents. You say, you know what? Let me enjoy my life. Let me enjoy my life. Let me figure out, at least God left me $10 million. Let me live this life of, of comfort. That, that I deserve something. First thing St. Mina did... During that time, he was promoted to be like an assistant commander in the army. And again, that was a very, very high rank within the army. And they had authority and they had control over areas. And they were the big shots. And one day, there was an edict when St. Mina was 15 years old. 15 years old. The emperor Diocletian made an edict, which is like a decree for the whole world that every church should be burned and every Bible should be burned and destroyed and every single person, every single person should offer their worship to the idols. St. Mina, with 15 million, $10 million in his bank account, said, 
I cannot accept to fulfill this. So he's being raised at a time there's no Bibles. Not there's no Bibles, there's no church. If we were to cancel liturgy for three weeks, I wonder what would happen to our congregation. If we just said, sorry, because of construction, we have to close the church for a month, I wonder where our minds would go. There's no Bibles. This is a 14-year-old boy being, living on his own, 15-year-old boy. He's in the soldier, he's in the army, and he hears this edict. He takes all of his money, gives it to the poor, keeps a few camels for himself so that he can do some work to survive and goes and lives in the wilderness. You say, okay, he's one of those. He went and lived a monk and he floated when he prayed and he, he flew on a cloud and all. This is a normal 15-year-old boy that has $10 million in his account. How does one get to this mindset? I want to know what it would take for you and me not to move to the wilderness, not to give all of our money to the poor, even just to tithe faithfully. I'm not, this is not a sermon about tithing. I'm saying look at the struggles that we have about the small sacrifices that we make. I was just in a, in a convent with 50 high school kids. And a lot of them were really, really challenged about some of the spiritual um, sacrifices that they need to make for their life at this stage in life. And it was like a war. And the kids were like, Abuna, we just feel this internal battle inside about a little friend that, you know, is a bad influence on me, so i got to give them up. Or i got to stop hanging out with these people or going to those places. And I'm thinking, this 15-year-old boy is in the face of persecution against anyone that says the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes to live in the des desert by himself. And he begins to live a life of worship, of prayer, and fasting. You say, okay, he's a monk. He's a 15, 16-year-old boy. He goes and lives, and the devil appears to him in the form of women. He has no father. He has no mother. He has no Bible. He has no church. And he's responding to the devil with the word of God. And the devil is appearing to him in the form of a woman to sin with him, and he casts out the devil. He does the sign of the cross, and he removes the devil. While he was in, his de in the desert, he saw a vision. The Lord gave him a vision of the martyrs, as they are being crowned by the Lord Jesus Christ and they're receiving an honor that he could not describe. And he felt like, I want that glory. I want to be a martyr for Christ. And he went and decided he was going to go to the governor and the prince of the, of the area while they were having a festival of other princes and governors. And he went in their midst and rebuked them. He was rebuking them, and he began to see this. He said, I headed to the wilderness, lest I mix and perish with you who worship the idols. He went into a party of those that are persecuting the people with the name of the Lord Jesus, and he stood up and he said, I did not want to perish with those that worship idols. How many of us have the mentality for myself, that I do not want to perish. I do not want to burn in hell. I do not want to be severed from the walk, from the way of God, and perish with those that live among the world. You see, nowadays we have these gray standards. And what's wrong with this? And it's our culture, and it's this day and age, and it's this, and it's that, and what? We do not mind to mix and to even consider that there might be a chance that I might perish among the idols. And he begins to confront them and saying, how dare you worship the idols and how dare you make this edict. So what does the governor say? He says, who is this person? Where is he from? Is he from our area? And people began to recognize St. Mina and they said, he was a commander in your army. What does St. Mina say? He says something so amazing. He said, I was a soldier in the army, but when I learned of your paganism, I wanted to be a soldier of Jesus Christ. I went to be with lions in the wilderness rather than mix with you. I'm asking you today, what would you rather prefer? To mix with the idol worshipers, the worship of the world and the worship of lawlessness and sinfulness and wickedness and every like debase thing before God or choose the wilderness. You'd say, Abuna, come on, we're not monks, so we're pagans. 
Which one are we? Are we wilderness people? No, we're not wilderness people. Are we idol worshippers? No, we're not idol worshippers. Where are we? In an age when there is no faith, there was no Bible, there was no... And he's saying, I chose to live with lions rather than to live with you. You see, this is somebody who came before and said, I'm willing to risk my life living with lions than to live with evil. Do we tolerate evil in our life? Do we tolerate sinfulness in our life? What happened? He said, look, Mina, be decent. These are actually the Coptic manuscripts say these things. He says, Mina, I want you to be decent. Because St. Mina was like giving it to them. And he says, I want you to offer incense to the idols, and I will give you an honor higher than your father. He is a, at this point, like a 17, 18-year-old boy. I will give you the honor of higher than your father, who was a governor. And he's going to be a prince. And he said, no way. You see, you want to know something scary? Is that the devil, the devil, gave the emperor patience so that he would make St. Mina deny Christ. I want to tell you a, a, a spiritual lesson. Is that the devil is very, very, very patient. Easiest thing for St. Mina, they take St. Mina and they cut off his head. Done deal. St. Mina gets the crown. He's good to go. Glory to God. No. The devil told the emperor, whispered in his heart, this is going to be a long process. We're going to make him leave the faith. We're going to make him abandon Christ. The devil might be doing that in your life. The devil might be doing the same thing in your life, is that he's giving, he, he's so patient to not give up on you. That day after day, he keeps offering you things that might seem as blessings from God. They might just see, God gave me this. He sent me this relationship. He sent me this money. He sent me this. He sent me that. And he sent me this promotion, even though I have to live a different lifestyle and I have to neglect my family and I have to neglect my life of worship. But the Lord blessed me. The devil gave patience to the emperor. Be careful. Are you part of the army of the Lord Jesus Christ? You say, what, what does that mean? What are you talking about? That's the problem. Is that a young man who was raised by his parents for only a very short time could tell himself without a Bible, without a church, that I am a soldier in the army of the Lord Jesus Christ. I will only live for Christ. And I will only live even if it means that I have to speak the truth to the governor himself. And he went. And he began. He was put on trial. You see, St. Mina hated evil. He hated evil. St. Paul says, abhor what is evil and love what is good. What's wrong with us that we don't hate evil anymore? What lifestyle are we living? What mentality, are, what, what frame of mind are we living with that we don't hate evil? Evil is, that's up to them. I don't hate it. St. Mina hated it. So when he went to the governor to tell him to get rid of this edict, we have to bring back the name of Christ. What are you, St. Mina, did you really think he was going to do that? Did you really think he was going to bring back the name of Christ? Yes, because he hated evil and he believed in Lord Jesus Christ. So they put him in jail. And when he was in jail, he went through this trial. And then we're going to begin his tortures. The first torture that St. Mina went through. They tied him to four pegs, like four sticks coming out of the ground. They stretched him and they flogged him until his blood came out like a river that all the land around him was red. That every drop of blood was like, like leaking from his body. And they said, Mina, we can stop here. Just raise incense and I promise you, you'll have everything say, that was a really bad beating. I don't know how much more of this I can take. Second torture. They beat him again until he bled. 
And then a prince came and told St. Mina, have mercy on yourself. You're just a youth. Enjoy the days of your youth. Doesn't the devil come and tell us that enjoy? Like, why all this torture? Why would I walk this narrow path? I'm dealing with, last week I was in a monastery with 50 high school kids. And for them, it was the biggest war. And it was so far from their understanding to be able to say, I need to walk down this path. And I say, what are we doing? What am I doing as a servant of God, as a priest? What are we doing as parents? What are we doing as brothers and sisters? That our kids cannot make a decision whether to follow Christ or to not follow Him. Oh my Lord. Oh my Lord that our kids are wondering, I don't know if I can follow Him. So what are you saying? Are you saying you can't follow Christ? Are you saying you won't follow Christ? This is St. Mina, second torture. St. Mina responded to that prince that said, you're in your youth. He says, oh, ambassador of the devil, who provokes, who provokes you to oppose the divine law? I know my master's mighty to help me endure the torment. How sure are you that the master will get you through the trials that you're going through? You say, I, I can't. It's been, it's been two months, three months, five months. It's been a year. I can't do it. St. Mina said, I know my master will get me through this torment. There's a beautiful verse that St. Mina says. You see, I want you to know before I say the next verse. When St. Mina went to the wilderness, he was prepared for the battle. That when this, this decree came out from the emperor that says, every Christian will have to worship the idols. And then the, one, the emperor that came after Diocletian, his name was Maximianus. He said, no, no, no. We're going to kill anybody that believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. First, the edict was Bibles and churches and, and raising Vincents and beating in prison. Now, it's killed. How did he face that? I want to ask you today, if something happened within our society that it became nearly impossible to be a Christian, would you have the strength to endure? Say, I don't know. I, I, I think I wouldn't deny him. St. Mina was fasting and praying for years that he would be filled with the grace of God, that the grace of God would be so powerful in him that he could say no to emperor after emperor. I don't know where our world is going to go. I don't know where our society is going to go. And this is why we look at the martyrs and we say, wow, how did they get to that point? Think about the small sacrifices that we can't make. The small sacrifices that we really struggle to offer. What happens if, if it becomes a real war? And I'm not talking about ISIS. and Something that tells you, like, you cannot be Christian in this society anymore. You cannot. You won't get promotions. You won't get, like it happens in Egypt, you won't get promotions. You won't be liked. You won't have friends. You won't be accepted. You won't be able to go to church and get whatever. Like, imagine. I'm not ready for that war. So I might just, what? Give up and say, the Lord could have defended us. The Lord could have been with us. The Lord could have strengthened us. But he was prepared for the battle. How many of us today are prepared for the battle? How many of us are saying, Lord, there is no battle right now. Thank God I'm living in an ivory palace. I'm living a great life. And I can't walk with you. I can't walk with you that holy life in the great life. What happens when life isn't so great? Are you prepared for the battle that the enemy of your souls wants to wage against you, and he's very, very, very patient. He's the most patient after the Lord. The devil is the most patient after the Lord. He's been fighting humanity since day one, and he's going to continue until the last day. And you are his target. St. Paul says this, for this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Because St. Paul had been filled with the power of God, he said what? I know in whom I have believed, I'm not ashamed. I am not ashamed to suffer these things. Maybe if you're a parent in here. If this is a very hard thing for you to say, Tell me about your kids. If you are a spouse, if you are a college student, 
And the war that you feel like you're dealing with every day and just being a college student this day and age. Imagine that one day a real war comes your way and you say what? I am sure and persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. I've already committed everything to him and I will continue to commit everything to him. Third torture. Listen to this. It's called the himbazin. The himbazin is a wheel with spikes on it, okay? And what happens is they tie you to the wheel. You're stuck on the spikes. And then the wheel goes around, and when you get to the ground, it smashes your body into the dirt or into the whatever gravel. And then you come around again as it's stretching your body. And you go around, and it smashes your face and your whole body into the ground. And St. Mina, it said... All of his bone, every bone, the Coptic manuscripts say that every bone of his body was showing. His flesh was falling off of his bones. Like when you find a chicken when it's really well, like slow cooked, and the, the, the meat is just falling off the bone. That was St. Mina. The governor said, do you feel the torture? Do you feel your torture? Are you ready to give in? St. Mina said this. He says, do you think torture can change my mind? Ya Rab. Do you think torture can change my mind? I'm not talking about a, like a, a relationship or not getting a raise or not getting it. I'm not talking about something. He says, do you think torture can change my mind from following you, following Christ with my whole heart? He says, don't you know that Christ strengthens me against these tortures? St. Paul said this verse, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Put something else in this verse. What would separate you from the love of Christ today? Losing a job? A bad economy? Getting kicked out of your college for whatever false accusation? I know a young man who was falsely accused. Somebody switched. He went and turned in a test. He erased. The, somebody went and erased the name when the teacher wasn't looking and put his own name. And the kid, our kid, the kid was a smart kid, and he ended up like failing his class and getting like kicked out of the class. Would you abandon Christ, or would you say nothing shall separate me from the love of Christ? I don't know. And believe me, I'm not speaking to you. I'm speaking to me. St. Mina told him, I'm guarded by the angels. He says, I do not fear. What Christ says, Christ said, do not fear the one who kills the body. But I'll tell you who you should fear. You should fear the one who can take your soul and cast it into hellfire. But we, we fear the one that kills the body. We fear the one that can just give me a bit of discomfort. But St. Mina had the word of God living in his heart. Mind you, every Bible was burned at this time. But he was, he was responding with the word of God. And then he said, stop saying the name of Jesus. We hate the name of Jesus and we torture those who say the name of Jesus. He says, do you know it is that the name of Jesus is what has sanctified my mouth and my body and my eyes? That because I live by the name of Jesus, your tortures will have nothing, no victory over me. Today, what is your body sanctified by? How many of us can say that my tongue is constantly sanctified by the words of Jesus, by the name of Jesus? That my mind is constantly sanctified, that my mind is so strong and filled because it is sanctified by the word of Christ. You say, well, I think I read the Bible every once in a while. I read it every day. Maybe I read a paragraph or something. He became holy. Because of this life. You see, the spiritual level of his generation was so great that they thought so lowly of materialistic honors that when they came to offer him to be a governor or a prince, he said, I don't care. Who cares? Keep it. He didn't think high of the world, even though at that time, the luxury was unheard of because of the amount of money that he had been exposed to as the child of a governor. He, he said... To the emperor, he says, you have mastery over my body, but Christ has mastery over my body and my soul. Who has mastery over you? Do you have mastery over your body and your soul, or does Christ have mastery? You say, well, I, I can't say that. 
But when we said about fasting and prayer, you didn't want to fast in prayer, and you're wondering why we don't have mastery over our body and soul, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell me. When I feel like I don't have mastery over these things, it's because I already conceded to not allow Christ to take over the desires of my body, to eat, to watch, to feel, whatever it may be, whatever pleasure it is that it, I don't have mastery. But St. Mina said, I've already given mastery over my body and soul to the Lord Jesus Christ. Fourth torture. They tied him to iron spikes. They tied him to iron spikes. And they pushed him into it like a bed. He was like laying on a bed of spikes. The governor says, I see that you face torture as if it were in a body other than yours. I see that you face torture as if you were in a body other than your own. You know what St. Mina said? St. Mina was like sticking it to him. He said, I'm like a man sleeping on a comfortable bed. Ulyani, do what you like. Do what you like. I'm comfortable the way I am. He says, it's as if you're offering your, a different body than is yours. See, that's why you don't care. But St. Mina could understand. He could understand, and it could have been that God was giving him the grace to not even feel. I've told you guys this before, that I met monks that were kidnapped several years ago and taken by, like, uh, Bedouin monks, and they began to torture them and electric shock them and rip out their beards and hit their mouths with the back of their rifles. And I asked Abuna, I said, Abuna, how did you endure that? He said, Abuna, I couldn't feel anything. I thought he was just being spiritual. He said, no, Abuna, I literally couldn't feel anything. They were going crazy. We couldn't feel. I said, wow. Christ has promised you that no harm will come upon you. That to St. Mina, laying on a bed of nails being tortured, he says, I'm like a man sleeping in a comfortable bed. Fifth torture. They put torches below his body for two or three hours. What did he say? He recited this. And the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together. And they saw these men. He memorized the scripture. And they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. Could you imagine? Could you imagine that his body is hanging over a fire for two or three hours and nothing touched his body? Which is why we honor the bodies of the saints. Because God has granted that the grace of his Holy Spirit would grant that these bodies would be holy bodies that can perform miracles, that can bring healings and do signs and wonders like we see in the book of Acts chapter 14, verse 2 or 3. When it talks about the... the, the the hands, God had granted the hands of the apostles to work signs and wonders. That's why we in the Coptic church or in the Orthodox church, we venerate the bodies of saints. And we believe that in those saints is the power of healing and miracles because the grace of the Holy Spirit has preserved those bodies. Then when he said this and he couldn't feel anything, anything they broke his teeth. They crushed his teeth. The sixth torture was a hundred scourges in prison. No, a hundred scourges, then they put him in prison. And then what happened? He went into prison, and there was over 125 believers that were waiting their martyrdom. And they were terrified. And they went in there, and they saw St. Mina, and they were strengthened. Maybe you are the one that's going to strengthen the people around you when you're willing to endure. Maybe your testimony of walking that path, when I was talking to the high school kids, they were like, but I don't want to be alone. I can't do this on my own. I can't follow Christ when I'm going to be the only person that's going to walk this way. Maybe you're going to be like St. Mina that's going to be able to say what? The Lord, I've suffered much, but the Lord has strengthened me. And they saw the glory of Christ in the face of St. Mina. The seventh torture. They took a saw. They, they laid him down and they took a saw. And as they were about to saw him in half, the saw melted. And the people that were about to saw him could not believe it. And they began to confess the God of St. Mina. To confess the God of St. Mina. Do you see when you endure your trials without complaining? And that your eyes are fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ no matter how bad it is. How bad is your trial? I don't know how bad your trial is. Where are your eyes fixed? 
maybe those around you might be saved. They might be saved because of the way that you've taken the trials that have come your way. And then they ended up beheading him and threatening to burn his body, and his body never burned. What's the point of all this? Is it just to talk about St. Mina? But to know that what your potential is, when you unite yourself to the Lord Christ himself, no harm will ever hurt you. No trial will ever break you down. Every trial will make you what? Stronger. It's hard in the middle. It's hard in the middle. But God will grant that the bed of spikes that you are laying on will be as a comfortable bed. I promise you, the way we deal with our trials is all up here. It's all in the mind. Nothing is really happening. It's a lot of stress and anxiety and fears and I can't and what if and they should do this and they should fix this and whatever. It's all up where? It's all up here. But because our minds aren't sanctified, we can't endure. May this great honorable saint who before he, as he was being prepared to be beheaded, the Lord Jesus Christ took him by the hand and he gave him a kiss. And he told him, blessed are you, O greatest of the martyrs. And he began to tell St. Mina all of these promises. That whoever donates to your church will have whatever blessings in heaven. And whoever calls upon your name and, 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 and goes to your body and honors you will be healed. And he gives him all these promises. The Lord Christ appeared to him at the middle. Do you believe that the Lord Christ will speak to you in the middle of your trials? Do you believe that the Lord has a message for you in the midst of your suffering? That he wants to tell you, blessed are you. When you endure, your children will be blessed. Your neighbors will be blessed. Everything in your life will be blessed when you endure this trial. May the great intercessions of the honorable Saint Mina, the wonder worker, be with us. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Let's stand up and sing the doxology to Saint Mina.